There we go. Hello and welcome back to Calculus 1, section 4.6 on linearization or linear approximation and differentials. <laughs> there we go. All right, I can hear the echo in the back and you can you can see the delay they built in so no one can stream snipe me over here. All right, so um, what are we going to do? Uh, we are going to just utilize our tangent line in a way that you probably didn't think uh, of before. Uh, for instance, say that I would like to compute the uh, square root of 3.6, right? What is the square root of 3.6? 0 0.6. Yeah. We'll see. It's not. It's Square root of 1 is 1, square root of 4 is 2, and this is in between, so it has to be 1 point something. Square root of 0 0.36. It's okay. Anyway, so um, let's just talk about this. Um, first off, we are going to just estimate and guess where this might be. So. Uh, 3.6 as an input. So I can take care of the square root of 1, which is 1, and the square root of 4, which is 2. Square root of 3.6 fits in between, so it has to be 1 point. And now you kind of look and say 3.6 is much closer to 4 than to 1. So, I don't know, 1.9, like that's your, uh, that's your guess, right? So this is us estimating, um, and, uh, you know, if you don't care, you just walk away, right? You're done. But this is what we can do and improve uh, our, our estimate and our calculation. Uh, if you draw a square root function, you realize that... At 4, you can find the tangent line. And now, you also realize that the value that you are looking for, which is 3.6, is actually here. And because this, uh, these pens are really, really thick over here, even if I, if I zoom in, uh, please note that the y value for the red line and the y value for the black line, which is the exact value, are very close, right, in the neighborhood of this uh, point. So, instead of computing square root of 3.6, how about if I compute 3.6 in this red tangent line? And the red tangent line we should be able to find like this. No calculator needed. So this is how they computed all the values in the in the good old days. So what am I going to do? I'm going to say, well, find the tangent line at 4. Because 4 is the easy value that I can compute in the square root. So I have my function that's driven by the... What am I trying to find? Uh, I'm trying to find square root of 3.6. I'm trying to find sine of 17 degrees. I'm trying to find ln of 3, right? I'm trying to compute something, and whatever I'm trying to compute, that's going to govern what function I get to use. Square root of x, sine x, ln x, right? Whatever I'm trying to compute. So now I have this uh, f of x equals square root of x, and then I'm computing that tangent line at x equals to 4. Now we know how to find tangent line. Get your uh, derivative, which is 1 over 2 root x, uh, to find m, uh, plug in 4, so that's 1 over 2 root 4, and you get 1 over 4. Right, square root of 4 is 2, 2 times 2 is 4, so slope is a quarter. Uh, you can find your y value quickly, which is uh, square root of 4, which is 2, and now you have your specs, m equals a quarter, and the point it goes through is 4, 2. So you can create your uh, tangent line, uh, y equal mx plus b, and uh, y is 2, uh, m is a quarter, 
uh, x is 4 plus b, uh, b is clearly 1. So my tangent line at x equals to 4 is given by y equals 1 quarter x plus 1. So what do I do? I claim that the square root of 3.6 is approximately equal to the y computed at 3.6, which is 1 quarter time 3.6 plus 1, <laughs> which is 1.9. <laughs> right? 3.6 divided by 4 is 0 0.9 plus 1 is 1 1.9. Uh, I, I guessed it. Uh, okay, bad example. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was not supposed to work out to be exact, but such is life. Okay, I'll, I'll try to remember never to use this again. 3.6 was a bad, bad value. Um, this is supposed to approximate, not give exact answer, but that's okay, fine. Um, so I hope you understand the concept. Please note that this um, approximation works only when it's close. Can you use 9? No, you can't use 9 to compute 3.6 because 9 is far away. And when you do the, the tangent line at 9, the value over here is off by a lot. So you make a lot of error. So your job is to figure out the closest nice value that you can compute tangent line at without use of technology and then use that for your uh, calculation. So let's um, work on another example. Uh, let's say ln3. What is ln3 equal to? Sure, take your calculator, put, you know, punch two buttons and you're, you're done. You, you have your decimals. But the question now is, can we do this by hand? And if we are doing it by hand, is, is it going to be precise enough, right? So what do I have? Well, for the graph, again, uh, we have our graph. Uh, this is where 1 is. This is where 2 is. This is where 3 is. And uh, at 3, right, that's what we want. Uh, which value is close to 3 that would work well with ln? It's definitely not pi because ln pi it's right pi is 3.14 that's close what value is close to number three that would work nicely with ln 2.7. yes which is e. e thank you so if you take a look at 2.7182818450 uh, and so on uh, that value, specific number, um, is uh, is actually E. And you can find the tangent line at E, and please look at the tangent line for the red line and the actual exact black line, you will see that the Y values are very close, right? So the, the trick for this section is to pick the closest possible nice value to the number that you want. What would be ln 10? Right? Is it e squared, e cubed? Right? So you can play this game, right? Of, uh, you know, ln2. Are we going to use 1? Or are we going to use e? You know, we can, we can, we can find this, uh, th these values. So let's go and, uh, and figure this thing out. So I have that f of x this time is going to be ln x because I'm trying to compute ln3. And uh, I also have uh, that I am computing this at 
x equals e because that's the nice value to work with ln close to number three. So what do I have now? Well, I have um, the derivative uh, f prime of x is going to be one over x and the slope m is given as one over e. Perfect. The y value is going to be ln e, which is one. And now I have the slope and I have the point, which is e comma one. y equals mx plus b. y is equal to one. m is equal to one over e. x is equal to e plus b. So how much is b? Zero. So what is my tangent line? It's y equals one over e x. Ta-da! Y equals one over e x. Uh, this x is in the numerator. You can actually call it just x over e. It's you can do that uh, because I don't want you to write x, you know like that because that's not a linear line anymore you have x in the denominator that's a rational function right so you want uh, x on top or x in a side where the middle of the x is hitting the line it's called ocd useful U very very useful so what is the ln3 well ln3 is going to be approximated by y computed at 3 and that is 3 over e well, 3 over e, e is approximately given by 2.7, as noted before. So this is 30 over 27 when you multiply by 10 uh, to get rid of the decimal. Now you cancel it by 3, you get 10 over 9, and this is going to be 1.11111 forever. So how about you go in your calculator and tell me the value for ln3? That's going to be approximation as well, by the way. But give me first 1.09. 1.09, mm -hmm. and we have 1.11. This is two cents. We're two cents off. Really, it's 1.09. 1.09 is all the way up. Yeah. So. Oh, 1.98. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's 1.1. Yeah. So we are one cent off. <laughs> okay? You are one cent off on computing <laughs> ln3, right? Uh, and as I said, you have the calculator, calculators on your phone, you have a standalone calculator, calculator on a computer, right? Calculators everywhere. So technically, you don't need, but there is a good use for this, right? When someone tells you, ah, what do you know? <laughs> I can compute ln3 by hand. What do you know? It's a really good comeback for, for something like that. All right? No, I'm serious. It works like a charm. I don't get invited places anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. I stay home, play video games in peace. <laughs> like, everything has its perks. All right? Um, So now let's take a look at, um, so the whole process now, I'm just going to call linearization because I have this curve, this LN curve, and I replaced the neighborhood of what I needed with a straight linear line. So when someone says the linearization, well, we just made the line straight. And it's easy to compute because it's a linear line. Same thing that, that happened up there with the with our um, square root. The square root is a curve, right? And um, we just did the tangent line uh, in the neighborhood so that we can compute in the tangent line rather than compute square roots. Um, so the whole process now is going to be called linearization. And instead of having this uh, three-step way to calculate tangent line, how about we write a single formula for tangent line? Sounds good? So I'm just going to write the formula, and then I will explain its features. 
and, and how we get it. So L of x is equal to f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. So this is the formula for linearization, but this is your formula for tangent line. This is the way to calculate tangent line for any function at point A in a single calculation. What was the process before? You go and you calculate derivative on the side and you compute the slope. Then you go compute the y value. Then you bring all of that into y equal mx plus b. You find b and then you write the line, right? So it was three separate calculations. You bring them all together and then you have the line. Now you have a single expression for the tangent line everywhere. Now, does this make sense? Well, sure it does. If you take a look here, you have your slope m. This over here is just like x minus x1. And if you move f of a to the other side, you have y2, sorry, y minus y1. Do you recognize this formula? You recognize this formula from algebra, right? All we're going to do is move y to this side. y is equal to f of a, because you are computing stuff at a, and that's your a as well. So a very simple uh, idea. We also know that the slope m is calculated when you plug in value into the derivative. So it makes sense for this to be our one line single calculation, a tangent line formula. Do you actually have to use it? No. If you already know the tangent line procedure and you don't want to bother with this formula, right? However, what is next after Calc 1? Aha, Calc 2. And in Calc 2, you get to improve, of, improve on this a lot. You will be adding infinitely many terms over here. Plus, and then infinitely many terms added to this. You will be able to go to any precision you want, which is why we use computers, right? Computers would be using these kind of things to compute stuff. Computers have no comprehension, right? It's all brute force computing. So um, all you need to do is to um, add second derivative term, third derivative term, and you will call that a Taylor polynomial when you get to count two. And then you will combine that into a power series, and it will be awesome in chapter 9. So this over here is useful for you to learn right now, because these would be first two terms of the infinite term power series for Calc 2. Now, that thing is going to become a term for expansion in differential equations in chapter 3. So you see how everything builds up? You learn the first two terms now, you learn the rest of the terms in Calc 2, and then when you hit differential equations chapter 3, you use all of that to solve differential equations. And what are differential equations? Well, they drive everything we have. All of physics, all of engineering, all everything, is derived from differential equations. So technically all this calculus stuff is a precursor so you can have a differential equation, which is equation that contains independent variables, dependent variables, i.e. function, and its derivatives. That's why it's called differential equations. And its solutions are functions. So all of this stuff will build up. And I know I started this lecture by you know, downplaying this stuff, saying that we don't use this today in calculations. That's 100% true. You have calculators. You are not going to reach for this formula to calculate ln7 because it's much faster to use the calculator. If you're on a desert island, then the calculator is gone and the Wilson is gone, obviously. Like ln7 is the next best thing you can do. But you know, if you can go to the movies 
you will just use LN7 on the calculator and go to the movies. Clear, right? So now let's uh, use this formula uh, to compute another value. So how about, have you ever wondered um, how much is a tangent of, um, I don't know, tangent of 25 degrees? I was thinking about this. What? I was thinking about this. This up. There you go. Perfect. He was thinking about tangent of 25 degrees. So now we will answer your your question. Exactly. How much is tangent 25? Well, first of all, as if you are to use the linearization on any trig function you must convert to radians otherwise you are doomed so conversion to radians 25 degrees you have 180 degrees and then um, pi radians on top so this works out to be 25 pi over 180 radians uh, you can cancel by 5, get 5 pi over, uh, that's uh, 336, right? So the exact question is tangent of 5 pi over 36, that's the exact question. But you can actually do better. Uh, isn't it that pi is uh, 3.14? Can't we just call that uh, 3 and cancel with 36 and get 5 over 12? <laughs> right? You can. Right? So you can, you can do some approximation there as well, bring the numbers to a better place. But let's leave it as 5 pi over 36 for now. All right. I'm about to work out the equation up there. What's my L of X? Well, my L X is, oh, I did not, sorry, I did not get A first. So what would be this value at which we should be computing stuff? Like the, the close value to, right? What is the X value at which we will be looking for a tangent line? 30 degrees, very good. Now that's pi over 6, exactly. So we will be working at with pi over 6. Yes? Is that because it's like close to 6 pi over 6, which is 6, which is pi over 6? No, it's 25 degrees. Yeah. So the closest you can get to the nice angles, which are 0, 30, 45, is 30. Oh, uh, I, was, I was thinking about like Oh, that will be, no, that will be the answer, yeah. So pi over 6 is 30 degrees, right? I'll, I'll put in parentheses over here, 30 degrees. All right, so what do I have? I have to have function computed at pi over 6 plus the derivative computed at pi over 6 times x minus pi over 6 because my pi over 6 is a. Great, let's go. L of x is equal to, well, function is tangent. So I have tangent computed at pi over 6. Uh, plus, what's the derivative of tangent? Very good. Which is uh, pi over 6. <coughs> x minus pi over 6. So, um, well, now we need to know some, some trigger values. Uh, tangent of pi over 6 is? Very good. Plus, uh, secant squared. Would we all agree that secant squared is 1 over cosine squared? So all I need to compute is 1 over cosine pi over 6 squared. And then I still have x minus pi over 6 on top. So L of x is equal to square root 3 over 3 plus... Cosine of pi over 6 is? Very good. 
No, I'm giving you enough time for those things. Uh, x minus pi over 6. And when we square, we will immediately lose the root. And right, so I have L of x is equal to uh, root 3 over 3 plus 4 thirds x minus pi over 6. Uh, this is your tangent line. Yeah, I know it, it doesn't look like y equal mx plus b, but here is your mx, and you combine these guys for b, and yeah, you got it. What happened? Oh, it's 8? <laughs> so now, tangent of 25 degrees is approximately equal to L computed at 5 pi over 36. So that's what it is. I'm not sure if you would label this as easier, but the calculation is is about to explode over here, but it's okay. We have uh, 4 thirds, uh, 5 pi over 36 minus uh, pi over 6, which is square root of 3 over 3 plus 4 thirds uh, times 6. So this is negative pi over 6 over here. Um, and uh, now common denominator, so 6 root 3 minus 4 pi divided by 6. Oh, hold on. No, this cancels. It cancels by 2. See, I could have canceled 4 and 6. Oh, no. This was, uh, this is a 36 over here, right? This is all bad now. The common denominator is... Um, 36. That's better. Okay, so now these guys cancel, and I have a 9 over here. I have to multiply 9 on the, on the first one. So I have 9 root 3 minus pi divided by uh, 27. I'm not sure what that is. Um, so now you have this and you still have no access to calculator what now right well do do not despair yet uh, isn't that pi like three eight point fourteen but who cares so you have nine root three minus approximately three over twenty seven well that cancels by three everywhere so you can you can you can still reduce these things. So, uh, when I cancel, well, 9 square root of 3 minus 3 over 27. So now um, I um, divide uh, by cancel 3. So that's going to be 3 root 3 minus 1 over, over 9. And um, I have, uh, just one sec. So, um, so that's the that's the value. Um, this value here is about uh, 1.7, 1.73, 2, you know, and um, times uh, times three is about 4.5, 3.5. So, um, 3.5, 3.6, about. Um, 0 0.4? No. 0.47. Oh, I missed the mark. I'm six cents off, right? <laughs> Keep the change. <laughs> so, you don't need calculators for any of these, these things, but we do have them, so we're just going to keep using them, <laughs> right? And... Um, and that's linearization. And you can condense the entire linearization in a single formula, and now this formula becomes your tangent line. And uh, as I said, this formula is going to evolve. It's going to become larger. 
And actually, eventually, in Calc 2, it's going to have infinite amount of terms. And if you use all infinite amount of number of terms, you are going to actually get exact function. And that is going to be the most powerful thing that you are going to see in calculus, actually. <laughs> you will be able... Well, I mean, derivatives and integrals are very impressive, but when you, when you realize that you can write exponential function as a polynomial or a trigonometric function as a polynomial and then you try to say well wow I can actually uh, integrate and differentiate polynomials like this right so you think of your chain rule of sine x squared but you write that in one step you write that as a polynomial and then you just differentiate that and you don't have to worry about the chain rule anymore uh, these things are coming up in chapter 9, Calc 2. And you have to build up to that point. So there will be more derivatives and more things to, to deal with. Uh, but this kind of power is, is coming up. And uh, you will be able to, you know, from here, push it forward. Uh, that was the part 1 of the lecture. Uh, part 2 is on differentials. So please note that the part 1 was approximating the value so I want to know what is approximately what is tangent of 25 degrees what is ln of 3 right what is square root of 15 these are the things that I want to know and your calculation gives the number at the end which is the value differentials which is our next right part uh, the second part of the lecture uh, differentials are going to, com uh, to approximate the change. For instance, uh, when you apply heat to an object, what happens to an object? It expands. Does it expand to the point where you can actually see all of that stuff? No. It expands a little bit. Well, is that important? Oh, yeah. It's important big time. Because do we have to, since we're still exploding dead plants and animals in our, in our cars to go from point A to point B, kudos to our technology. Uh, when you have that cylinder inside and they have the uh, pistons inside and the piston and the rings on a piston, do you understand that it has to be a tight seal? in between the engine block and that piston. Otherwise, the explosion that happens underneath will escape on sides and will not give power. It will not push piston. It will just escape. Now, what happens if the car is cold, right? And uh, you turn the engine on and you are actually exploding the, the fuel by injecting the fuel, injecting the oxygen, Lighting the spark, which is what the spark plug is, it lights up that, explodes it, and that pushes the piston, right? If the tight is too much, it's going to seize and it's not going to move. If it's too loose, all of the explosion fumes, right, that were supposed to push the piston will escape around it, right? It has to be just perfect. So you design the whole thing but then you don't consider the expansion due to heat because aren't we talking about high temperatures due to you have explosions in there right that's what you are driving around the, the little you're driving a car that, that constantly explodes things in the engine to propel so um you have to uh account for that in your design uh, airplane engines, right? That's going to spin very, very fast. And um, is that going to create some, some friction, some heat and things? You have to account for that. Have you driven over large bridges in New York that you have to pay like $20 and a firstborn child to get over it? You remember, you know those bridges? Uh, the... Uh, you you know those joints right that are that are you drive over you can actually see the abyss through those 
but then in the summer they close up. Why? Yeah, the bridge got heated and expanded and then those closed. In the winter, you can see the abyss, right? They can be like five, six inches apart in the winter. In the summer, they close up. There's your civil engineering there, right? Uh, train tracks. You've been on a train, maybe. What's happening in the summer? Smooth ride. What's in the winter? Tuck, 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 tuck. Tuck, 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 tuck. Tuck, 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 tuck. Is it going? Why? First set of wheels goes, right? Because those rails are not going to be connected. There's going to be a gap. So every time the wheel goes over the gap, you get a tuck, right? Tuck, 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 tuck. That's the first two wheels because always pair of wheels. And then the second two wheels. Tuck, 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 tuck. Tuck, 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 tuck. As it goes through, right? It's always like that. Listen for it when you're in a train. You're not going to hear it in the summer. Why? Yes, they expand, right? Now, actually, railroad people figure it out the hard way because when they, the first, uh, you can Google the pictures for that. Um, you make them tight, right? And in the summer, what happens? They expand and they start bending, they all pop out. They have to because they're very long, not that thin. The linear expansion is going to be high but you have expansion this one and the next one is expanding this way so you're getting expansion this way you have to compute those things as engineers so at all times you know these are not huge but you have uh, you have to compute them uh, the last one I'm going to mention is um, the design of C well you don't know what the CDs are uh, blu-rays <laughs> Why wow, you, you actually know what the CDs are? They look exactly like like DVDs uh, and Blu-ray, but they they carry music only on them. There, there's no picture to it. It's just just music. And then there was a device you put it in called CD player. There's no picture. It's just music comes out. All right. So um, I am. <laughs> no, I, I, I only listen to LPs at home, so that's that's even that's even better. I'm about to put a hundred dollars and like disqualify two or three people over here and then just say, you tell me what the LP is, you can have the counter box, right? Um, so um, think about this. When you pop the CD play a CD or DVD or Blu-ray into your, your player starts spinning very fast. What reads the information? Laser. What happens to objects as laser hits them? No, what happens to the object? The object heats up because it's been hit by a laser. Have you ever taken the disc right after you listened? Um, oh, sorry, the, the I have to see in the movie have you taken it out immediately? It was warm, right? So what happens to the plastic disc when you heat it up? It expands, right? So you have a disc that spins with omega, and then you have a linear track over here with that laser reader that goes left and right. If the engineering did not account for expansion of the disc, and you know how precise lasers are when they read things, what would you get on a movie or a song or anything like that if that was not counted then? Yeah, exactly, right? So what I'm going to talk about now in terms of differentials from points of design across your fields is extremely important. But again, this technique is now obsolete because you can calculate exact change like this. So you don't need to use differentials to actually approximate the change. So, uh, differentials. So, differentials approximate change. Uh, exact change is given by delta y, which is y2 minus y1 where y2 
is f of x2 and y1 is f of x1. So these are the, the values. But for more complicated formulas, right, you still use the calculator to compute all of these things. And again, in today's day and age, it's not an issue to compute this at all. But as we are, as I said, honoring our ancestors now, we are going to take a look at the method that was uh, replacing the exact calculation. And uh, that one is actually very easy to derive. You start with the notion that y is equal to f of x. Then you take the derivatives of both sides and you use Leibniz notation on the left and the prime notation, which is technically Newton's notation, on the right. And then you move dx to the other side. And there you go. This over here is known as differential. Now, we have to be a little bit careful with the things that are inside. Uh, first, dx is the same as delta x is actually x2 minus x1. So these are equal signs in there. Delta y is approximated by dy. They are not the same. Not the same. But they're close. They're close. So this is why instead of calculating the exact change, I can calculate differential, which will approximate that change. And differential is this delta y that I've been talking about. So, let's take a look at an example of this. So, approximate the change in volume of the sphere when radius grows from 3 inches to 3.12. Inches. So you see that radius grew a little bit, right? From 3 to 3.12. And um, clearly, the volume of the sphere is larger. And we just want to know by how much. So we're calculating the change. I'm not calculating new volume. I'm calculating because the radius changed, what is the change in volume? That's what I'm computing. Now, can we do this exact? The answer is yes. We have calculators, right? 4 thirds pi, 3.12 cubed, minus 4 thirds pi, 3 cubed. Calculator does its job. We are done in today's day and age. We have exact change. In what? Depends how fast you can type. Right? That's it. But in good old days, 3.12 cubed, you know, it's already a stretch. <laughs> so, let's see the approximation. I know that the volume is 4 pi thirds r cubed. That's the volume for a sphere. I need to find differential. So, dv is going to be... 4 pi r squared dr. That is the differential. All I did is I took the derivative uh, in respect to r. Right? It's not implicit differentiation or anything like that. This is just a straight up take the derivative in respect to independent variable. In this case, that's r. And then move uh, that you know, it will be dv dr, and then you move that dr to the right side. That's all it is. 
you already have, so this thing over here is approximating dv, delta change, right? So we'll, 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 we'll take a look at that. So what's my dr, my uh, change in radius? Well, change in radius is new minus old because it grew. It better be positive change in radius. So all, all dr is, is the gain in radius, and that's 0 0.12 inches. We know that radius used to be 3 inches, and all you need to do is to plug in. So change in volume, approximated, right, is 4 pi, 3 squared, times 0 0.12. That's all it is. And uh, as you can see, you can do this even without a calculator. I mean, uh, four times um, it's four times nine. That's uh, thirty-six pi. So thirty-six pi uh, times twelve divided by one hundred. And then you can do canceling and and all of that stuff. Um, thirty-six and and hundred divided by four. Uh, you get uh, 9 times 12 pi divided by uh, 25. Uh, what's 9 times 12? 90, 108, right? Yeah. So 108 pi divided by 25. Yeah, 108, that's almost like 100. So that's uh, that's a 4 pi... Uh, four times, uh, it's about 12, right? But again, we are approximating. So, you can, now, let's use the calculator to see 108. Um, did you calculate the whole thing? 13.56. inches cubed. So if the radius grows by those 0.12 inches, the entire volume will grow 13 point, 13 and a half, about 13 and a half inches cubed. Now, as I said, today's day and age, we have calculators, we can actually calculate exact just to check. Check. We need four pi over three, and then 3.12 cubed minus 4 pi over 3 times 3 cubed. Now we can factor out 4 pi over 3 and just do 3.12 cubed minus 3 minus 27. See you next week. So we have... Four pi divided by three times open parenthesis three point twelve math three there we go minus twenty seven calculator gives fourteen point twelve. We are fifty cents off. Who cares? Right? Not that bad. As I said, we have the calculators, we have the computing power, so today we can just run the blue stuff and not worry about approximating things. Or maybe you like to approximate. Maybe something like this is really interesting to you, so go ahead, do it. Right? Is what it is. Uh, the cool thing here is that you can use differentials to also compute the values. You know, like square root of 15 and stuff. We can actually do all of those with differentials as well. Because now you have the value you want to compute and the cool value at which you can do the derivative, right? There is a change between them. So, if I want to use these differentials... To compute, let's say, square root of 15, I will do this at a equals 16 for function f of x equals square root of x. So, 
Let's compute the differential. dy is equal to 1 over 2 root x um, times dx. So now uh, I am um, calculating well delta x, which is my well, that's dx, is going to be 16 minus 15, which is equal to, to 1. And uh, my dy is equal to 1 over 2 square root of 16 times 1, which is 1 over 8. So the change, delta y, is approximately 1 over 8. So what is my square root of 15? My square root of 15, oh, come on. Square root of 15 is approximately square root of 16 minus the change, right? Because 1 over 16 is overshooting the answer I need. So I need to subtract the change in y. And that is 4 minus 1 over 8, which is 3 point. And then the, this is 1, 2, 5. So that's going to be uh, 8, 7, 5. So square root of 15 should be approximately 3.875, and I used the uh, uh, differentials for this. Now let me see, square root of 15 calculator. Says that the square root of 15 is approximately 3.873. Wow. This is... This is more precise than, than the, the gas station, you know, thing. They have 9 over 10, <laughs> the price. Uh, we have 3 over three over 10, we're good. So um, this is the, the full lecture, right, on, on differentials and, uh, and linearization. We use it to approximate things. Um, and in today's day and age, we really don't need to approximate a lot of these things. We can calculate them exactly in engineering because you have access to computing power of Mathematica and MATLAB and Maple and all of the mathematical software. Plus, you have your calculators and computers and everything else. So, yeah. It will be back. You will use it, but you will use it in a different way, as I said, when Calc 2 comes along and differential equations, so you need to know it, but uh, much of this stuff is obsolete today because of our tech. Bye.